It's late January in Northern California, and John Miller's bees are on the move. Tonight we'll load about 456, maybe 480 beehives on this semi. It takes about 25 loads like this. This truck will be very near 80,000 pounds gross weight. They're good. John Miller's operation is part of the largest annual bee migration in the world, and it's all because of these. Whether you call them almonds or almonds, this is California's biggest export crop, exceeding two billion pounds in 2011. California produces almost all of the almonds grown in the United States. It's had a compound growth rate of over 9% for 20 years. And what's driving this incredible growth of almonds is its nutritional profile. It's a complete whole food, it's a, it's a wonderful package of nutrients, and it's very versatile. California has over 800,000 acres of almonds. It's kind of a staggering number to imagine. While there are native insects that derive nutrition that visit for pollen and for nectar, we need to be able to bring in these quantities of bees, the European honeybee, to effectively cross-pollinate each of these flowers. And so at two colonies to the acre, 800,000 acres, we require 1.6 million colonies, 60% of all the bees in the United States required in California for pollination of almonds. A third of our diet, over 90 different foods, are depending on these honeybees that visit the almonds and then they go visit the cherries and then they make broccoli and they help develop onion seed all over the United States. The reason the European honeybees are so good at this job is that they're domesticated and we know where they live. So at night when it gets cold and the sun goes down, they come back to their house, we can load them on trucks and we can move them to the next crop. So these bees are doing real good. This is all new wax right here and that's an indicator that they're doing well. The successful almond grower needs to know a lot about honeybees and Dan Cummings is no exception. In addition to farming over 9,000 acres of almonds and walnuts, he also breeds queen bees, which he supplies to beekeepers around the world, like John Miller. Let me find the queen. She's usually in the safest, warmest part of the hive, which is usually the center three frames upstairs, and there she is. She is the mother of the colony, one per hive. She's constantly emitting a pheromone called queen mandibular pheromone that assures the colony all is well. Mommy's here. It's her job. Keeping bees is in John Miller's DNA. His great-grandfather, Ennie Miller, is widely acknowledged as the founding father of migratory beekeeping in the U.S. A little more than a hundred years ago, there were no highways, there were no interstate systems, but there were railroads. My great-grandfather went to Southern California one winter and saw the orange trees in bloom in February and March. I thought if I could get my hives from northern Utah in the winter to southern California for this early bloom for this honey source, he could make more honey. This is remarkable. This hadn't been done and it's the first large-scale migratory beekeeping since the Egyptians oared them down the Nile 3,000 years ago. See, it's a nice day to be out gathering pollen. Somewhere out within a mile of this spot, mustard plants have begun to bloom. Somewhere out here, early wild daffodils have begun to bloom. And somewhere out here, bees are finding this pollen and bringing it back to the hive. That's like a miracle. This is last year's honeycomb. It's easy to share John's lifelong admiration for these amazing insects. And that's really good. But in recent years, this fragile partnership has faced a growing list of challenges inside and outside the hive. In part two, the urgent quest to understand what's killing America's bees. Today is really a perfect day to experience almond pollination. It, it just doesn't get any better. There's not much of a breeze, about 70 degrees. You can hear the buzz in the orchard of the bees. You can smell the nectar. It looks like something you'd see in a museum in a painting. Despite appearances, however, this timeless picture of natural harmony is now in peril. America's bees are dying in record numbers. There's the inside of the hive. Now, it looks like chaos to you and me. It's perfectly ordered to them. 
About 2005, the industry experienced a near collapse and it was mysterious and we didn't understand it and there's a lot of it that we don't understand it even now. It could be associated with death by a thousand paper cuts. One challenge to an organism may not be enough to cripple it or kill it. Three or four challenges to the same organism could be overwhelming. It's a beautiful day out here in the orchard. Christy Heinz is executive director of Project Apis M, a non-profit organization devoted to funding research into honeybee health. Colony collapse disorder, or CCD, uh, is still an unresolved problem. It's probably a uh, combination of several factors. Varroa mite is, a, is the major pest of honeybees. Varroa is a mite that sucks on the hemolymph, the blood, if you will, of a honeybee. The honeybee would actually die, not of the varroa mite, but because of the virus that the varroa vectors. Pesticides is a very controversial subject. A beekeeper uh, wants no exposure to pesticides for his bees. However, the grower must spray some crop protection compounds to protect his investment, protect his crop. And so we work very hard to develop management practices that both suit the grower and suit the beekeeper. Poor nutrition plays a major role. We want a diversity of food supply. We want diverse pollen sources. Because of our specialty crop grant funding from CDFA, we do have funds available to uh, purchase seeds and do demonstration forage plots for honeybees to help us figure out which plants are best uh, to complement our crop plants in terms of providing diverse nutrition for honeybees. These challenges, pesticides, parasites, the, the, the erosion of pasture, good healthy pasture for bees to forage on, these three are central to stabilizing the national herd. And right now, we're not stable. You know, we're, we're really struggling to keep the national herd in one piece. Until the mysteries of colony collapse are resolved, beekeepers will continue to experience painful losses in their hives. Still, despite this threat to his livelihood, Miller harbors no regrets about his choice of profession. Great job. I was put on this planet to keep bees in a box. From the age of six, I knew what I wanted to do, and I've always loved the bees. I have the best job in the world. I have this great privilege of working in the agricultural sector in California. It is the most productive agricultural center on earth. Why wouldn't I want to be here? As an almond grower, Dan Cummings shares Miller's outlook and remains optimistic about the industry's ability to meet these new challenges. We're truly in a very fortunate industry being almond growers. Yeah, the honeybees is a concern, but we're getting better at managing our honeybees. But I'm confident that we'll have sufficient honeybees to continue to pollinate our almond crops. If he's right, then John Miller and his fellow beekeepers can look forward to many more years of loading up their hives to stay one step ahead of the pollen as it flows through America's orchards.